Welcome to part two of this video in which we are computing the discrete time Fourier series coefficients of a rectified sine wave using the properties of the discrete time Fourier series. So rather than uh, working out lots of nasty looking summations, uh, we're, looking, we're working out somewhat less nasty looking summations by using properties. Uh, in part one, we had basically set up the problem. Uh, we have the Fourier series coefficients of our square wave and of our sine wave. And now we need to find the Fourier series uh, coefficients of the product of our square wave and our sine wave. And as I said at the end of the part one, uh, this is done by convolving the Fourier series coefficients of R with the Fourier series coefficients of S. So if we go to, a, uh, to an empty work space here, uh, we can say that um, d of k, or d of k is the Fourier series coefficient of the product of r and s. This is uh, the summation, where l is over one period, of a l b k minus l. And uh, convolution, it turns out you can uh, uh, switch the indices here. So I can also write this as summation of L over N, A K minus L B sub L. Okay. So the idea is that sometimes it's a lot easier to do this form than it is to do this form. So let's look at what we have um, for our a sub k's. Uh, let's see, we have, whoops, we have lost them. Our a sub k's look like this. So um, there's lots of non-zero terms here. Our b sub k's look like this. So there's only two non-zero terms. So I think what will be the easiest to do is to use this guy here, because we'll only have two terms in the summation for which these b's are non-zero. Now, again, I could do it with this and get the same answer, uh, but this one looks like it's going to be a little easier. OK, so the values of L for which b sub l is non-zero is l is equal to 1 and l is equal to negative 1. And because uh, these b's are periodic, um, this is also the same as l is equal to 23. So it shows up in this graph out here at 23, but I'm going to actually call it negative 1 because um, that's going to make it a lot easier. So to make that work, uh, my sum here will be the sum L going from, say, minus 12 to 11, because I just have to sum over one period. It doesn't matter how I organize that. A of K minus L, B of L. Now, B of L is 0, except when L is equal to 1. So when L is equal to 1, I have A of K minus 1 times b of 1. And when L is negative 1, I have a of k plus 1 times b of negative 1. OK. And um, it turns out that b of 1, this is just 1 over 2j. This guy here is negative 1 over 2j. So I can rewrite this whole thing as 1 over 2j a uh, sub k minus 1 minus a sub k plus 1. OK. So this gives me a way of computing my Fourier series coefficients of the product of my square wave and my sine wave. And if I graph these, um, which I have done, I get a graph that looks like this. 
Okay, so this is what the D uh, sub Ks look like. And except for two phase terms right here that are uh, pi over 2, all the phase terms that are non-zero are either pi or negative pi. And since those are essentially mathematically equivalent, my plotting program sort of picked them randomly. Uh, so if you wanted to tidy this up, you could actually have pi's everywhere or minus pi's everywhere. Okay, so this is what these um, the, the Fourier series coefficients look like for V, which again is the product of R and S. And um, we've computed this so far without actually have plugging in a whole time series and using the summation. Isn't that exciting? Okay, so the last thing we need to do, let's see, we can say this guy is done. So now we need, need to take V of N, shift it to the right by 12, and add it to V of N. Okay, so um, let's bring up another empty uh, guy here. So um, V of N, whoops, shifted to the right. My uh, drawing software has all of a sudden lost its head. Okay, V of N shifted to the right by 12. Well, this is an example of the time shifting property. So, let's see, time shifting is here. So if I take X and shift it to the right by some number N0, then I will have the Fourier series coefficients of, F, of X times this uh, complex exponential. So in our situation, we have uh, V shifted to the right by 12. So V has complex, or has Fourier series coefficients that I've called D sub K. And now we'll have this times E to the minus J um, K 2 pi over 24 times the time shift, which is 12. Okay, and if you look at this, um, I have 2 pi times 12 over 24, that's just pi. So I can write this as e to the minus j k pi. Okay, so this e to the minus j k pi, because um, uh, just ba basically the way it's structured, this is going to be 1 when k is even. Okay, so e to the, um, uh, so for example, e to the 0 is 1, e to the minus j 2 pi, that's cosine 2 pi plus j sine 2 pi, which is 1, and so on. It's going to be minus 1 when k is odd. Okay, so what this um, tells me then is that the shifted version of V is going to have Fourier series coefficients that look like this, D sub K times, and this is one way of writing this in a way that you don't have to use this, but it actually, I, in some ways I don't like it because it um, sort of obscures what's actually going on. Okay, so if I then have V of N plus V of N minus 12, this has Fourier series coefficients D sub K. This has Fourier series coefficients uh, D sub K times minus 1 to the K, where again, that means this. And uh, because the Fourier transform is linear, uh, if I have a sum of two time waveforms, and, well, the Fourier series coefficients of the sum will be the sum of the Fourier series coefficients. And so you'll notice when k is odd, I take d of k and multiply it by minus 1. So I have d of k minus d of k, which is 0. So this is going to be 0 when k is odd 
when k is even, I have d of k plus d of k, which is 2 d of k when k is even. So it turns out, this is basically what we were after. Uh, this, again, is x of n. So this is my Fourier series coefficients of x of n. And so what I do to uh, get my final set of Fourier series coefficients is go through uh, the Fourier series coefficients I had for v and multiply uh, the even ones by 2 and get rid of the odd ones entirely, set them equal to 0. So when I do that, um, I think we're at about here. No, it didn't go far enough. We're about here. Okay, you can see that every even Fourier series coefficient, I'm sorry, every um, odd Fourier series coefficient has been set to zero. And the even Fourier series coefficients are twice the ones that we had uh, for V of N. So we're done. This basically gives us then the Fourier series coefficients of our um, uh, of our uh, rectified sine wave. Now there's a couple things to point out here and then um, I'm also going to go back, I may have to do this in part three, and show you an alternative step to multiplying the um, R of n and S of n. You'll notice that my C sub 1 coefficient and my C sub 23 coefficient are both zero. Okay, so this means that my signal, my x of n, has no component that has a fundamental period of 24. So x of n has um, no, oops, something terrible just happened again. Okay, I won't write it down. x of n has no, no component that has a fundamental period of 24. Does that make sense? Well, if you look at um, what we have here for x of n, you'll notice that by taking v of n, shifting it to the right, and adding it in, we've actually created a function x of n that has a period that's half of the original period of the square wave and the sine wave. Okay, so in fact, the fundamental period of this x of n is 12, which explains why, oops, which explains why I can't find this again, which explains why this term is zero, because this is the one that corresponds to a fundamental, uh, to a frequency um, with a fundamental period of 24. Okay, well, it looks like I'm out of time, so in part three, I'll show you an alternative to doing the multiplication of R and S and the corresponding then circular convolution. We'll use a different set of properties to um, work that, and uh, then we'll be done. So, thanks for watching. See you in part three.